All right, this talk is how to JIT, building a simple uh, JIT compiler for Python from principles by uh, Matt Page. Uh, now, Matt has uh, requested that uh, you hold off all your questions until the end of the talk, and Matt will be outside and be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. So without, uh, with that, uh, here's Matt. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Matt Page. Uh, and so we're gonna talk today about building um, a simple JIT compiler for Python from first principles, but we're gonna do it in Python. Okay, so a quick outline of how the talk is gonna progress. First, I'll give, I'll introduce myself and then go over some of the motivation for why we'd wanna do something so crazy. Uh, then we'll go through a high level overview of what we're gonna build. Then we'll transition into talking about some supporting uh, runtime infrastructure we need. And finally, we'll close out with building a bare bones compiler. Okay, so who am I? Uh, well, I'm a husband and a dad of two amazing daughters, one and four. They keep me super busy. Uh, in my free time, I moonlight as a software engineer at Instagram. And I've been there since uh, 2017. And I've worked mostly on Python related projects. Uh, so initially, I worked on bootstrapping types into our code base. Uh, we have about 2 million lines of Python code that were initially untyped. So we built this open source project called MonkeyType uh, that collects types at runtime, and you can use those to generate static type annotations. And then for the, about the past year, uh, I've been focused on Python performance work. So specifically, how do we make Python go faster for Instagram? All right. so. Um, why would we want to build a JIT? Why would we want to do something crazy like this? So first off, it's a lear learning opportunity. Um, for me, the best way to really understand something uh, and to really understand how it works is to build it. Uh, I'm not a compiler expert, so I'll probably say some wrong things here. Um, but I've always been curious about how JITs work, uh, and even more so with the recent focus on performance work. Um, and so in learning about that stuff, trying to d dive into a uh, production quality JIT compiler is pretty hard. Uh, there are large, complicated pieces of software. Um, and that's not intended uh, as a criticism. They're kind of that way out of necessity. Uh, but so it can be easier to start from something small. I also think it's really fun. Uh, I like understanding how things work. And I also like being close to the metal. Uh, and you can't really get much closer to the metal than this. And finally, uh, you actually start to see opportunities for special purpose JITs um, once you kind of understand that a, like a baseline level how they work. Uh, depending on your workload, you can actually see large constant factor speedups with pretty low effort. Um, so a couple examples of this are like the PCRE regex library actually has a JIT compiler. So it can compile your regexes uh, into machine code. Uh, graphic shaders are another great example of this. Um, so you kind of start seeing places where if you have access to data at runtime, you might be able to generate uh, more efficient code. All right. Um, so first off, kind of let's go over at a high level what we're going to build. Um, you know, like, what even is a JIT compiler, right? Uh, <laughs> let's break down what it's doing. So for the purposes of this talk, um, it's something that translates Python code into machine code at runtime. So it's compiling while your program is running. Uh, this is where the, the JIT comes from. That stands for just in time. So you take a Python function. You stuff it into this magical black box, and out pops some native code. And there are lots of different kinds of JIT compilers, but we're going to focus on a simple method at a time template JIT. And we'll see what that means as the talk progresses. Hopefully, you'll, you'll leave this, and you'll have a good understanding of what that means. So breaking this down uh, into subcomponents, um, so we have this JIT. First, we said that it needs to translate Python code into native machine code. And so we're going to focus on uh, x86-64 on Unix-like systems, so like Mac OS and Linux. Uh, so we're going to need a compiler. This is the thing that's going to take Python, and it's going to spit out machine code. Um, so we have some machine code. We're going to need a place to put it, and it's going to need to be executable. So we need a memory allocator. And finally, we need to be able to integrate it with CPython so that we can call it. So we're going to need a foreign function interface, uh, or an FFI. 
um, that will let us call native code from Python. And we're going to say that this sort of foundational layer, uh, that's our runtime. That doesn't deal directly with translating Python code into native code, but it's required to sort of wire everything together and make it all work. OK, so let's look into how we might implement a runtime. So we're going to do that. I like to learn by doing. So we're going to do that by implementing the world's simplest JIT compiler. Uh, this function, we're going to JIT a function that computes the meaning of life. Um, so it's just going to return 42. Uh, OK, so diving in, first off, we import the C-types module. Uh, and that's part of the standard library. And that gives us a way to call native code from Python. So that's our FFI piece. Next, we're going to import the MMAP module. And that gives us access to the MMAP system call. And we can use MMAP to allocate executable memory from the operating system. So this is our memory allocator. Uh, if we were going to do this for realsies, uh, we would need to worry about limiting the amount of memory we've allocated and freeing it. Um, but for now, since this is slideware, uh, we'll just free it when the process executes. Or sorry, exits. Um, OK, so then we call MMAP. And that gives us uh, 4K of readable, writable, executable memory. And the map private just says, hey, operating system, uh, if a child process tries to write to these bits, create its own mapping. And the map anonymous just says, hey, operating system, we don't have a file backing this mapping. So then we write out some code into the memory we've just allocated. We expose it to Python. Uh, so here we're saying, well, using C types, here we're saying, hey, Python, treat this address as a function that returns an integer. And finally, we call it. And it prints out 42. Awesome. But taking a step back, uh, we didn't talk too much about this magical binary string. So this is the x86-64 encoding of the assembly shown here. Uh, move 42 into the register racks and then return. So racks is special. Um, that's where return values go. And then we had to translate that into some machine code for the CPU. So this means we're actually going to have to do instruction encoding. And this is something we'd rather not have to focus on. Uh, we'd rather focus on the high-level task of translating uh, Python into some higher-level representation, say, uh, uh, say assembly code, for instance. OK, so we don't want to deal with manual instruction encoding. And to avoid that, we're going to use a library called PeachPy. So PeachPy uh, is an awesome open source library uh, that was originally designed for writing hand-tuned, highly optimized computational kernels for numerical computing applications. So think of things like uh, math applications where you as a human might actually have a higher chance of writing something more efficient than a compiler would produce. Um, it handles all of what we just went over. Uh, so instruction encoding, allocating executable memory, exposing it to Python, and more. Uh, and it exposes uh, a high-level DSL that lets us write that assembly what we wanted to in Python. So this is great. So let's revisit the world's simplest JIT using PeachPy. So this looks are already kind of a lot shorter and hopefully a lot more clear. So walking through what this is doing, first we're wildcard importing everything we need from PeachPy. Normally, we'd probably want to avoid doing this, but this is what lets us use it like a DSL. We'll see that in a second. Then we declare our function. So we say, hey, we have this function. It takes no arguments, uh, and it returns a 64-bit integer. And then we get to use the, uh, the nice PeachPy DSL. So we're actually writing assembly code, but we're doing it in Python. So we're moving 42 into the register racks, and then we're returning. And this is where PeachPy, I think, really shines. Um, so we can actually just dump all of that uh, C types, instruction encoding work off into PeachPy. So there's a lot going on excuse me, in this line. Uh, but PeachPy is taking that assembly code we wrote, lowering it down into machine code, allocating executable memory, and then exposing it into Python for us. Under the hood, it's doing this using C types and MMAP. So we at least kind of know how that works. But we don't have to think about it anymore, which is great. Then we call the function, and boom, we get 42. Awesome. So we've now figured out. Uh, the runtime bits, um, let's dive into the compiler. But before we get too deep, we're going to go over a bit about how the CPython VM executes Python code that we write. So here we have a simple function called add, 
that just adds its arguments. Uh, and on the right, so that's what we write. That actually gets compiled by CPython into bytecode that you see uh, on the right here. So this is bytecode for a stack-based virtual machine. Uh, if that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry. We're going to walk through this bytecode uh, on the next slide. So here we have the bytecode we just saw. And the blue arrow is going to represent the instruction pointer for the virtual machine. And the empty space on the right is going to house the contents of the stack. So initially, uh, it starts out empty. After we execute the first instruction, this first load fast instruction pushes the value of A onto the stack. Then we execute the second load fast instruction, and that pushes the value of B onto the stack. And then we execute binary add. And this pops two values off of the stack, adds them. And so for whatever that means, because this is Python, uh, you know, if it was two integers, it could be doing integer addition. Uh, if it was two strings, it could be concatenating them. And then it pushes it back onto the stack. And then finally, return value pops the, pops the stack and returns the result. OK. So under the hood, Python implements this pretty much as you would, as you would expect it to. The interpreter loop is basically just a giant switch statement. So for every opcode, there's a case statement. And then it's just constantly going over the bytecode, doing this fetch, decode, execute cycle. So grab an instruction, decode it, figure out what to do with it, then execute the corresponding case statement. OK, so this kind of begs the question, uh, if CPython already has C code for every opcode, can we compile a function by looping over the bytecode and just emitting the equivalent uh, native code? So we basically would just take the assembly code for the case statement, and we spit it into uh, an executable piece of memory. So as you probably anticipated, uh, the answer to that question is yes. Um, and this is the essence of a template JIT compiler. So instead of a fetch decode, ex fetch decode execute cycle, we have a fetch decode emit cycle. So we just walk through the bytecode, and we go boom, 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 uh, and we emit some assembly code. Okay. So what does that look like in code? This is the basic skeleton of the compiler. It's pretty straightforward. It's not really a lot more code than we saw um, in our world simplest JIT example. I've omitted imports for brevity. Uh, so we have a function that takes as input now uh, a Python function, and it, and it produces as output a JIT compiled version. So we have to emit a prolog. We're emitting, or sorry, we're executing code on the we're executing native code now, which means we're going to be running on the machine stack. So our prolog is going to need to handle things like saving the base pointer, copying arguments to the stack, and then some CPython specific stuff like grabbing the gil. After we've emitted our prolog, we can just iterate over all of the instructions like we said before. We can emit some assembly code for them. And then finally, we get into our epilogue. And so here we see another feature of PeachPy which are symbolic labels. Um, so we emit a label for the epilogue, and that lets us uh, reference it from jump instructions throughout the code. And then we emit our epilogue, which is just emitting some assembly code to pop the stack and clean it up, and then return. OK. So now that we have the skeleton in place, we're going to uh, excuse me, flesh out some basic primitives. Uh, once these are done, we're going to have a solid foundation in place that we can take uh, and we can extend as desired. So to start off with, we're going to walk through how we'll emit some assembly code for a couple of opcodes. This will just kind of help us get some intuition and see how simple things are. So first off, um, let's take that meaning of life function again. That compiles down into two opcodes, load const and return value. So we're going to implement the emitters for this. And once we're done with this, we'll actually be able to compile our first Python function. Not super useful, but a, but a cool milestone. Uh, OK. So to develop some intuition here, we're just going to look at the case statement from the interpreter loop. And this has been simplified for brevity, uh, but I think this captures the essence of what's going on. Load const just loads a constant value out of a code object for a function uh, corresponding to the argument for the opcode. Then it increments its reference count, and it pushes it onto the stack. So what is our generated? Uh, or what does our emitter look like for this? This is pretty straightforward and is not a ton of code. Uh, 
so this is the first one we're seeing, so we'll just go over the function signature. It takes as input the function being compiled and the instruction. We grab the constants uh, for the function. Then we move the constant into a register. So here you'll notice we're calling ID, and this is just a CPython implementation trick. ID returns the address of its argument. We're putting it into a register. Register doesn't matter, or the choice of register doesn't matter here. We increment its reference count, and then we push it onto the stack. So our assembly generation code looks pretty much like what we saw in the interpreter loop. So now let's look at return value. Return value again, super simple. Um, we just pop the, we pop the stack, and then we exit the interpreter loop. The uh, emitter code looks correspondingly simple. So we're popping into a register. Here the register is actually important. Uh, so this racks register is where return values go. And then we jump into our epilogue, which again cleans up the stack and returns. OK, awesome. Moving right along, we can look at local variables. So keeping in this theme of uh, simple pieces of code, we have an identity function that returns its argument and we have its corresponding bytecode. We only have one new opcode here, which is load fast. So if we look at the uh, interpreter code, or the case statement inside of the interpreter loop here, we see that we're fetching uh, an argument from the locals array in the frame, and that's specified by the argument to the opcode. We increment its reference count, and then we push it onto the stack. Awesome, this is pretty straightforward. Before we can dive into the emitter, though, we're going to have to talk a little bit about stack layout. So we said that we're going to execute on the C stack now, and we're going to use that for local variable storage. So when we enter into a function, our prolog is actually reserving space on the stack for local variables. And then it updates RBP, which is the base pointer, to point at the first local. So to load a local variable i, we compute its offset relative to RBP. And this, um, and on x86-64, the stack grows from higher memory addresses to lower memory addresses. So we need to end, we need to subtract from the base pointer. And then finally, we're going to have to scale it by the size of the things that are on the stack. So we're just pushing pointers here, which are eight bytes on x86-64. So we just multiply that uh, index by eight. So now that we have that, uh, the emitter code is really straightforward. So we just load the argument into a register. We increment its reference count. And you'll note here that we're no longer using the PeachPy DSL. We've abstracted that away into a helper function. This is a great feature of being able to write assembly code in a high-level language like Python. You can do refactoring, uh, and it actually makes sense. Uh, and then, you can just, then we just push it onto the stack. So again, this is all pretty straightforward, which is really, really cool. Um, OK, so we're almost done. Um, now we need to talk about calling into the C API. So we want to be able to call back into C Python from generated code. It turns out that a lot of core C Python functionality is actually written in C, and it's exposed through the C API. The interpreter loop often delegates work to these functions, and we'd like to be able to do the same thing from our generated code. So here we're going to revisit uh, our simple addition example, uh, and we have the disassembly on the right. We've covered everything so far, except for binary add. So let's dive into that. So this looks pretty familiar. Um, we're popping our arguments from the stack. Uh, but then we have to call this helper function, pi number add, using the arguments we popped. Uh, and so this is where the interpreter loop is actually calling back into CPython. Um, so we'd like to be able to do the same thing. So we need to figure out how to do this. And this basically amounts to just being able to resolve the address of a function at runtime. So to do that, we lean on C types again. Here we import it. Then we import Python API. And Python API just exposes the C API as a shared library. Then we load uh, a helper library for resolving symbols. Then we expose dlsim, which, which is just the function we need to resolve a symbol in a shared library. And now we can. Uh, finally look up a symbol inside of CPython. So now we have something uh, that we can use to build on top of. Once this is in place, um, the emitter looks pretty straightforward again. So now we're popping our arguments. And the registers here now are important, because these are the registers uh, that arguments, or the first two arguments to be precise, uh, are expected to be in. So we pop those. 
And then we call our helper function to resolve the address of pi number add, and we move it into a register, and then we call it. OK, great. Um, we're almost ready to wrap up. Uh, the final piece I want to go over is how we represent control flow. So up to now, we've only dealt with straight line code. How would we want to handle something a little bit more complicated? So we're going to uh, look at a, another helper function again. Uh, in this case, we have this max function that just computes the maximum of its arguments. Uh, and the disassembly on the right uh, is a little longer, but we've implemented everything except for these two opcodes, compare op and pop jump if false. So we'll walk through how those work. So compare op just pops two values off of the stack, compares them using a predicate, and in this case, it's greater than, and then it pushes the result back onto the stack. Okay. So pop jump if false is probably pretty straightforward if you, <laughs> if you can read. Um, so we pop a result uh, off of the stack, um, and then we jump depending on that result. Uh, so in this case, uh, if, if it was false, we update the instruction pointer to point to 12. Uh, and if it was true, we fall through to the next statement. So what happens here if we wanted to modify the bytecode of a function? Say we wanted to optimize it. Uh, we could end up invalidating the offset that's used in the jump. How would we represent this more abstractly and in a way that lets us not have to worry about that? To do that, we're going to reach for control flow graphs. So a control flow graph is a directed graph where nodes are basic blocks, uh, which are just sequences of straight line code with no branching in the middle of a block. You can only branch at the end. And then edges represent control flow. And this allows us to edit the graph without worrying about invalidating jump targets. Once we have a graph, we can transform it back into linear code just by performing a graph traversal. So how would we want to build one of these things from some, from some bytecode? The first, the first step is to just identify basic block boundaries. So an instruction starts a new basic block uh, if it's the first instruction, if it's the target of a branch, or it follows a branch. So in our example, 0 starts a basic block because it's the first instruction. Uh, 8 starts a basic block because that follows the, the branch instruction. 12 starts a basic block because it's the target of a branch, and then we're done. OK, so now that we've got basic blocks, we can build a mapping from offset to basic block. And then finally, we can add edges uh, by going through and mapping offsets to the corresponding basic block. So integrating this into the compiler is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is the updated compiler. Again, not super different. Only now we're going to iterate over basic blocks uh, instead of just iterating over instructions. For each basic block, we emit a label. And we saw this earlier. Uh, and this, again, lets us uh, emit jump instructions using symbolic labels rather than offsets. And then we can delegate fixing up those uh, symbolic jumps into absolute jumps um, to PeachPy. So then for each basic block, we go through and we iterate through the instructions in it and we emit uh, the assembly code for it. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then that's it. We're done. Now we've, we've pulled a, an entire control flow graph uh, into our compiler. So takeaways. Um, first off, Python is awesome for exploration and prototyping. Uh, at this point, we have the basic structure of the compiler in place, and we can compile real functions. So we can't compile a whole lot yet, but we actually have a fully fledged working compiler here. And we have the structure that we can build on uh, to, to make this into something more real. And that's really awesome. We did that in like 25 minutes. Um, it's an incredibly small amount of code. It's like two or 300 lines of code. Uh, and it's just, yeah, I think it's pretty amazing. Um, low level work doesn't have to be scary. Uh, we did all of this from Python. And we generated native assembly code, or native machine code, sorry. Uh, and we executed it. And now we have a JIT that has a REPL, uh, which is I think it's pretty cool. Um, OK, so future work, uh, what is there to do? Uh, <laughs> the answer is there is a lot to do. Uh, you can add emitters for more opcodes. CPython has about 120 opcodes, and we really only covered three. Exceptions. So we didn't talk at all about how we deal with exceptions or how we represent them in the control flow graph. This is pretty, this is tricky, but it's, uh, but it's doable. We haven't talked about generators or async functions. Um, those need to be able to suspend and resume at arbitrary uh, points of execution, uh, which means we need to figure out how to save and restore the stack and register state. 
And then finally, the big one, which is optimization passes. So the generated code, uh, or the code that we've generated now is going to be pretty slow. Uh, it's going to be, at most, a little bit faster than CPython and maybe even a little bit slower. We've really only compiled away the interpreter loop. Uh, but with a little bit of work, we can actually start producing something that is much, much faster than what CPython can do. And the name of the game here is uh, type specialization. So if we go back to the example of addition, if we can generate specialized code and we know that the types of the arguments are integers, we can instead just emit uh, machine code to add integers as opposed to calling out into the CPython API. All right. Thank you. Uh, I hope you guys thought that this was interesting. Um, if you want to go play around, the source code is up uh, and available on GitHub. Um, I'm here all week now. Uh, thank you for your time, guys. <laughs>